The fact is, Republicans didn't find much fraud, really any fraud, because there wasn't much of any fraud. So what they're trying to do now is to make the voting rules harder for people to vote, particularly harder for young voters uh, and minority voters to vote, and essentially manufacturing um, irregularities where they don't exist, so that they can then use those made-up irregularities in 2022 or 2024 to argue that elections shouldn't be certified uh, and therefore uh, uh, subverted. There you go. That's the plan. Hi again, everyone. It's 5 o'clock in New York. Gone are the days where Republicans merely cry fraud without evidence. Why? Because, as you heard right there from voting rights attorney Mark Elias, Republicans are now manufacturing those irregularities, ensuring that they have something to hold on to next time they try to overturn the election result. Elias writes about these efforts in his latest piece, saying that members of the GOP are redefining the term fraud. Quote, several states, including Georgia, Iowa, Kansas, and Texas, have criminalized practices that were previously legal. Some of these laws target voters, whereas other provisions are aimed at election workers. The result is the same. The goal of these new provisions is to manufacture fraud where none exists. It is a calculated, concerted, feverish effort that will be hard to stop without federal voting rights legislation. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer announcing today that the Senate will hold a procedural vote next week on the updated voting rights legislation that Joe Manchin negotiated with others in his party, although it still faces long odds in the Senate without filibuster reform. In the meantime, we are seeing some victories in the courtroom in Georgia, as the Atlanta Journal-Constitution reports, quote, a judge dismissed a lawsuit Wednesday by Donald Trump supporters who sought to inspect absentee ballots from last year's presidential election. A decision that came a day after Georgia investigators told the court they were unable to find any counterfeit ballots. Superior Court Judge Brian Amaro's ruling ended the last remaining major lawsuit over Georgia's 2020 election and prevented an outside review of Fulton County's 147,000 original absentee ballots. Over in Wisconsin, calls to end an investigation into the state's election results are mounting, though, as the former judge who was leading the review said he does not have a comprehensive understanding or even any understanding of how elections work. And the subpoenas he issued earlier this month had glaring errors. And in Colorado, the Washington Post is reporting this, quote, a Colorado judge on Wednesday prohibited a local official who has embraced conspiracy theories from overseeing November's election, finding she breached and neglected her duties and was, quote, untruthful when she brought in someone who was not a county employee to copy the hard drives of Dominion Voting Systems machines. These decisions upholding the rule of law in our democracy are a big deal. But the courts cannot be the only guardrail we have to preserve our elections from GOP-led subversion, which is why Mark Elias stresses we must act now. More from his piece, quote, we are one, maybe two elections away from a constitutional crisis. In the days following the November 2020 election, Trump and his allies executed a plan to subvert the election result. While they failed... Republicans learn from the experience and are prepared to try, try again. The future of our democracy rests on whether those committed to free and fair elections will prepare as well. The looming constitutional crisis over our elections is where we start this hour with some of our favorite reporters and friends. Former top State Department official and MSNBC political analyst Rick Stengel is here. Also joining us, Aaron Haynes, editor-in-chief at The 19th, as well as an MSNBC contributor. And our good friend Matt Dowd is here. He was chief strategist to George W. Bush's re-election campaign. He's now a Democratic candidate for Texas Lieutenant Governor. Uh, thanks to all of you for being with us. I want to start with you, Aaron, and Mark Elias's articulation of what is really happening out there. Because... We cover it every day, as you know. We call on all three of you to be part of these conversations. It's never clear to me that Democrats understand the Republican game. And the significance of what Mark Elias did was to sort of, you know, beam down into right-wing world, where it is a malevolent, a cynical, an anti-democratic campaign. But it is a, it is a rocket. 33 laws have been passed. They are barreling ahead. As he writes, they are manufacturing ways to claim fraud because even Republicans, when injected with truth serum, have to say there wasn't any. What do you make of that as a wake-up call? Well, you know, Nicole, it's just as you pointed out, it's so important to uh, stress to your viewers that this is what 21st century voter suppression looks like, right? It's not just 
working to keep certain people from uh, having access to the ballot box with things like, you know, long lines or limiting precincts or eliminating drop boxes, those kinds of things. It is also about even if those people are able to jump through all those hoops, overcome all those obstacles to cast a vote, negating that vote on the other side is what feels new about uh, Republican efforts to, to really uh, subvert folks from having access to the ballot. And, it, you know, the election results, as you point out, only became more valid in places like my home state of Georgia. Surprise, uh, as we sit here today, Joe Biden still won Georgia by 12,000 votes. Uh, but the big lie is only becoming bigger. We, we see that. But that is not stopping the former president and others from continuing to tell it. And so that's why these piecemeal solutions uh, are in the absence of federal intervention are not going to be enough. And, you know, we talked. Uh, earlier this week kind of about, uh, you know, who in the Democratic Party is actually still fighting uh, to, to keep voters, uh, you know, keep voters' access to the ballot safe. And I had the chance to check in with Senator Raphael Warnock from my home state of Georgia, who was actually on the road in, in uh, Matthew Dowd's Texas uh, today. I uh, talked to him about the state of play uh, in terms of voting rights. I mean, this is one of only three black senators who came into office in this special election that took a record turnout, even as the big lie was beginning to take shape, right? So this is literally hitting close to home for them. And, you know, when the GOP refused to even debate this issue back in June, Warnock was already worried that the conversation was shifting away from voting rights to things like infrastructure. And so he went to Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, let him know that he was not going to get on board with Build Back Better unless he got a commitment that voting rights was not going to fall off the table in terms of Democratic priorities. And so that happened. Uh, and so Warnock and this group of seven other Democrats have come up with the Freedom to Vote Act, which Senator Joe Manchin is a co-sponsor of, right? Uh, and it's a compromise bill. They acknowledge that. Uh, but things in it, like making Election Day a federal holiday, right, uh, having enough drop boxes so that you don't have one drop box for, like, a whole county or a whole community, uh, 15 days of early voting that might include, uh, that would also include weekends. Uh, and Senator Warnock is basically saying, you know, he's determined to go down fighting if it comes to that and to make Republicans kind of say where they stand on the issue. Uh, Republicans did submit a framework for an alternative proposal earlier this month, but Warnock is already saying that it basically sounds like all carrots and no sticks, that it's not going to do a lot to stop any of the voter suppression tactics because it focuses more on financial incentives and not really on enforcement. But they know that the clock is ticking. I mean, you've got something like 20-something voting days left, uh, you know, for Congress. And the concern here is to get this done kind of ahead of the partisan gerrymandering that is happening uh, in, in states. Uh, that effort is already underway. Aaron, let me follow up with you. Does Senator Warnock acknowledge that there are no Republican votes and filibuster reform is needed if this is to pass? Well, what he's saying is that, you know, he's letting Joe Manchin do his work with, with, with Republicans who, uh, you know, to see who may be open to this Freedom to Vote Act, being that, you know, it is a slimmed down version of, of the For the People Act, which Republicans obviously were not on board with and didn't even want to discuss. And so I think that is the phase uh, that we're in now, uh, you know, trying to let Senator Manchin try to, uh, you know, uh, see if this this if there is any bipartisanship to be had uh, now that they are are negotiating. But I mean, yeah, where he is now is, uh, you know, telling Senator Schumer, uh, let's uh, move forward so that we can we can debate uh, the issue of voting rights on the floor and, and make Republicans really say where they stand on this issue.